as I see it, the debate about SOPA is a debate about collateral damage, about the impact of these bills on everybody else. So when the members of Congress who support these bills got together, I don't think they sat down and said, let us limit free speech online. Let us do away with due process. Let us make it more difficult to make the internet infrastructure secure. Oh, and yes, let's hurt one of the few sectors that is the internet startups and technology companies who are still adding jobs in a difficult economy and create enormous value for all of us. And while we are at it, let us outlaw many of the tools that human rights activists all over the world use on a daily basis to do their work. I really don't think that's what they wanted. But that's what these bills do. And so I think the debate about SOPA is a debate about unintended consequences. And no matter what you think about copyright and piracy, I think you should want to understand the collateral damage that these bills do. You know, fighting piracy and protecting copyright are really legitimate goals. But if these bills threaten free speech and internet innovation and other values we care about, I think we need to find a better way to deal with these problems. <coughs> and third, I think learning about SOPA is just the first step. If you come away from this event thinking, wow, I really think these bills might affect me or my company or my work, I think you should consider doing something about it. Why? Put yourself in the feet of a member of Congress who thinks about how to decide how to vote on these bills. You have a bill in front of you. It is backed by very powerful industry groups. The movie studios, the record labels, the pharmaceutical companies. Industry groups that you have worked with, you and your colleagues in Congress have worked with for decades. These groups have flown in numerous CEOs to tell you how important this bill is for them. They have spent an enormous amount of money this year alone, more than $94 million, <coughs> on lobbying to convince you that this bill will be able to stop online piracy once and for all. You know, they are on track to outspend, break all of their previous, previous spending records this year. You know, last year alone, they spent more than 10 times as much as internet technology companies on lobbying. They even got the international firefighters to send you a letter saying how much they care about SOPA. So if you look at this from the perspective of a member of Congress, this is an easy case. Unless, well, unless you hear from those who are affected by the bills. Unless you hear from the users, the entrepreneurs, the VCs, the network engineers. Unless you hear from them directly and in large numbers. You know, it's really easy to underestimate how important that is. You might think, oh well, I'll let my industry association take care of this. Or maybe I can sign a letter. All of this is important. But it is not as important and as powerful as calling your member of Congress and talking with them or their staffers directly about what this bill means for you. As many members of Congress have told me again and again, if the CEO of a company doesn't think this bill is important enough to take the time and talk with me about it, it can't be that important to this company. The content providers have learned this. We need to learn this too. So let me hand things over to Tony Falzon, our moderator for tonight. Tony is the executive director of our Fair Use Project and heads our work in the areas of copyright <coughs> and fair use. He is a seasoned IP litigator and copyright expert. And you might have heard about him recently when he argued a very important case on copyright and free speech, um, the Golan case, before the Supreme Court. I'm really glad that you have decided to, uh, that you have agreed to help us think through the consequences of SOPA tonight. So thanks again for coming and I look forward to a great event. Thank you and welcome everybody. Um, we are here to talk about, of course, the Stop Online Piracy Act. So one of the questions 
we'll explore tonight is whether it will in fact stop online piracy. But the big question is at what cost? That's the collateral damage, the unintended consequences Barbara mentioned. How is this bill going to impact you, your business, or your client's business if it passes? How will it affect the future of innovation online? We have a spectacular panel to help us explore these questions. I'll introduce them now, but first, the standard disclaimers. The views they'll express are theirs, not necessarily those of the organizations they're affiliated with. And as for me, the views I express may not even be my own because I'm the moderator. <laughs> I may say some things I don't agree with just to push the discussion. Uh, and they may not reflect my views on soap or anything else. So first on my left here is Mark Lemley. He's the William H. Newcomb Professor of Law here at Stanford and the director of the Law, Science, and Technology program. He's also a partner in the law firm of Dury Tongri in San Francisco, where he advises and represents a wide array of technology companies, including Roja Direct, in its effort to reclaim its domain name after it was seized by the federal government earlier this year. On his left is Fred Von Lohman, senior copyright counsel at Google. Before coming to Google, he was a senior staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where he emerged as one of the preeminent voices on technology policy and litigated cutting edge copyright cases and trademark cases across the country. On his left, we have David Ulovich. He is the founder and CEO of OpenDNS, world's largest and fastest growing DNS and cloud-based security service. He was recently honored as a World Economic Forum 2011 technology pioneer. On his left, we have Albert Wenger, an entrepreneur who has helped f found five companies here and in Europe, now a partner at Union Square Ventures in New York, which has invested in and helped grow lots of startups in the media and technology space, including Boxy, Tumblr, Twitter, Turntable, and Zynga. Last but not least, oh wait, no, we have two more. Sorry, it's hard to see all the way down there. I think the next one over there is Josh Mendelson. He's a partner here in Silicon Valley with Hattery where he helps grow startups and nonprofits. He's also on the steering committee of Engine Advocacy, a new organization that's aiming to increase the involvement of startups and their supporters in shaping government policy. Finally, Paul Vixie, chairman, chief scientist at Internet Systems Consortium, among other things, a primary author of Bind, the leading DNS server software in use today, and a co-author of what I will say is an incredibly helpful white paper on the security and technical concerns raised by the DNS filtering requirements imposed by SOPA and the Protect IP Act. So that's our panel. As for you, if you're here, you probably know a little bit about SOPA already, but it's a complicated bill. We provided a handout I hope you have, which provides a brief overview of it. Um, on the most super general level, SOPA's most contra controversial provisions do three things. First, it creates a mechanism for the Attorney General to obtain an injunction against so-called so foreign infringing sites, and then serve notices imposing obligations on internet service providers and search engines to block access to these sites. It may also, the Attorney General may also serve notices on payment network providers and internet advertising providers, requiring them to suspend financial transactions and advertising services for these sites. Second thing it does, it creates a mechanism for individual intellectual property owners to serve notices without any judicial involvement, identifying a site as one dedicated to the theft of U.S. property, at which point payment network providers and internet advertising providers must suspend financial transactions and advertising services for these sites unless the site serves a counter notice. Third, it imposes criminal liability for unauthorized streaming. These are a few of the things it does. It goes beyond that. Some of those are in the summary. Some of, them, some of these things we'll discuss more. Quick note on its status. It's moving fast. It was introduced in the House on October 26th. The Judiciary Committee held its hearing on November 16th. And the markup is now scheduled for December 15th, which means the full House is likely to vote. That's uh, actually now obsolete. That uh, markup has been scheduled for December 14th. Oh, it's OK. So we've been moved up a day. Moved up a day. So that means that Full House is likely to vote in January, maybe even earlier. A new wrinkle has developed in the last few days. A group of six Congress people and four senators, including Anna Eshoo, who represents this district, this district uh, have announced they're going to roll out a new proposal that would dump most of the above in favor of an approach 
that puts the enforcement authority with the International Trade Commission. And under that proposal, the ITC would be authorized to initiate an investigation at the right holder's request and issue a cease and desist order against foreign websites that are primarily and willfully engaged in infringement. That order would then compel financial transaction providers and internet advertising services to cease providing their financial and advertising services to the foreign website. <clears throat> but it would presumably not apply to service providers and search engines. I'm told the full text of the proposal is probably going to be released tomorrow. We'll put it up on our site as soon as it is. So let's get to the panel discussion. Um, Mark, I want to start with you. You've been an outspoken critic of Protect IP and now SOPA. But the bill has 27 bipartisan co-sponsors who say it targets the worst of the worst at pirate sites and provides an important new tool to cut them off and shut them down. So what is the collateral damage? What is the immediate impact you're worried about? Well, I mean, I guess I'm worried about a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> the first has to do with the question of what it is we're defining as illegal and therefore subject to these uh, fairly draconian penalties. Um, the the, exist, the, the SOPA version of the bill, the two pieces, the House and the Senate side are different. The SOPA version of the bill um, <clears throat> kind of dances around that question a little bit. It says, oh, well, whatever, whatever existing forfeiture authority exists for United States uh, websites, we're going to apply to foreign websites. Um, what is that authority? Well, it's not entirely clear. Um, Civil forfeiture allows the government, so the idea behind civil forfeiture is you're dealing drugs out of your car. I can criminally charge you. Uh, I get to seize under the civil forfeiture statute the drugs, uh, and I get to seize the car because the car was being used in the facilitation of this crime. Um, so the government's uh, uh, theory in the cases that they've already been seizing in the United States is, well, Websites are involved in criminal copyright infringement, uh, and so we can seize the website. Now, a lot goes into the word involved there. Um, sometimes this is a theory that says this website is in fact doing nothing other than itself engaging in direct acts of criminal copyright infringement. And if that's right, then the statutory authority probably extends to allow them to seize that website and shut it down. Uh, though even then, we probably ought to be a little worried about the free speech implications for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. But the government's also been seizing sites uh, that don't themselves actually engage in anything that looks like criminal copyright infringement or even civil copyright infringement, uh, but uh, allow people, for example, to post links to other sites, some of those links in turn pointing to things which turn out to be copyright infringing. Uh, and so the government here says not, well, you're engaged in criminal copyright infringement and therefore I can seize your website, but you're engaged in facilitation of someone else's act of criminal copyright infringement and therefore I can seize your website. What is facilitation? Well, the government says, ah, you know, it's anything that helps, right? If you post a link, um, or if you run a computer service that hosts a link uh, to a website uh, that itself has infringing content, you've made it easier for people to find that infringing content. Uh, and so we can seize your site. Uh, and you know, uh, with all due respect to my, uh, my colleague here, uh, uh, Fred, uh, Google is a site that not deliberately, but certainly makes it easier in various respects to find infringing material online. Um, you want to search for infringing material on Google, you can. Does that mean Google's facilitating copyright infringement and therefore could be seized? Government's view is yes. Now, maybe the government wouldn't exercise that authority, but as the lawyer representing another specialized search engine whose site has been seized by the United States government, I'm not entirely comfortable relying on the prosecutorial discretion of the government to decide only to seize really bad actors. And the second point I want to emphasize, there are other uh, things people talk about. The second point I want to emphasize has to do with, with free speech here. Right? The difference between seizing uh, drugs or seizing a car in which you sell drugs and seizing a website uh, is that in the latter case, we're shutting down speech. 
And in this country, we have some pretty substantial restrictions we tend to impose before we allow you to shut down speech. All right, so the government says, ah, oh, well, your website is facilitating copyright infringement. Let's assume that's true. All right, there's criminal copyright infringement out there. We've made it easier as a result of the actions of a particular site. It's almost certainly also the case that some of the information on that site is not criminal copyright infringement or is not facilitating criminal copyright infringement. If you got an injunction against copyright infringement, you'd be shutting down the infringement and not shutting down the non-infringing stuff. Uh, but if you just seize the website, you're seizing everything, including the speech uh, that we understand, we all agree, is protected, is not actually infringing, not even helping anyone else to infringe. Under the First Amendment, we call that a prior restraint on speech. And we generally ban it, even when the government has a really good case. What we say is, government's got to make its case before it gets to actually shut down speech. Uh, so in the New York Times versus United States case, the Pentagon Papers case, you may recall, uh, government whistleblower uh, disclosed a bunch of government secret documents about the war in Vietnam to the New York Times. Government went to the New York Times and said, this stuff is national security, you can't publish it. And the Supreme Court ultimately said, government, you can't say that. It might, in fact, violate the law to publish it. But you've got to go to court and prove it violates the law. You don't get to shut down the New York Times publication of this article in advance of a determination that the information being published is, in fact, illegal. What the government's doing and what SOPA would authorize the government to do uh, is precisely uh, to seize the New York Timeses of the modern world and shut them down in advance of a hearing because they say, hey, there's illegal material on those sites. Uh, and so the problem I have, at least the sort of first set of problems I have, is we've done an end run around the First Amendment uh, and we've done so in a way that I think is very dangerous uh, to the open architecture of the internet. Well, so, so let me follow up on one, on one thing. You mentioned an injunction as an alternative, and I think a lot of people who are pushing for SOPA will say, look, that just doesn't cut it here, because what we are talking about, number one, are sites that are overseas, uh, and you can sue them, and you can do whatever you're going to do, and the court can say whatever it's going to say and issue whatever injunctions it's going to issue, but they're not going to follow the order. So that's why we have to come back and do something more drastic, like seize the domain, block the domain. What's, what's the response to that problem? Well, so I, I mean, so you're right. That is an argument that's often heard. I, you know, the, the difficulty with that argument, I think, is it just turns out to be untrue, right? So um, you think about the copyright cases in the digital environment we've seen over the last 10 years. Uh, they were filed against companies like Grokster, Rockster was a three-person company based in Nevis, an island nation in the Caribbean. Uh, or Streamcast, which was based in Vanuatu, out in the Pacific. Uh, 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 wrong guys. Uh, Morpheus. That's that's uh, Morpheus. Streamcast, uh, is the, is the, Streamcast uh, my client, was based in Nashville. They were American. All right, yes. fair enough. Nashville, another foreign country. <laughs> another uh, you're right. Uh, Kazaa, uh, right. based in Vanuatu. Um, or John Johansson. Right, it was a 15-year-old Norwegian uh, high school student. Um, all of them got hauled into court into the United States when they engaged in activities that affected the United States. Right? So the, the argument that says we can't otherwise reach out beyond our borders with existing copyright law to get people acting abroad uh, to infringe copyrights in the United States, I just think empirically is untrue. We pull them into court all the time in the United States. So, uh, so, so, Fred, I want to, I want to, I want to turn to you. And, and you know, when Protect IP came out earlier in the spring, it got its share of criticism. But when SOPA came along, we saw Google, Facebook, Zynga, LinkedIn, Yahoo, and a lot of other big names in Silicon Valley get a lot more aggressive um, yeah. and what, become what, a lot what more we, unified. What we like to call the AOL to Zynga right. of internet companies. So, but, so what I want to know. So, so what, from Protect IP to SOPA, what galvanized all of you? What's the impact? you're worried about? Uh, so there were a number of things that were very different uh, about SOPA. 
uh, compared to Protect IP, sometimes called PIPA, uh, in, in the Senate version. Um, that said, there are a lot of commonalities that are troubling uh, as well. Um, so let, let me talk about a few of the issues that sort of stand out as both similar and different in, in those two. Um, it, first, the one, th the one thing that's clearly in common uh, is they were aimed at, at least nominally, going after foreign rogue websites. That was certainly how they were both billed. Um, and here, uh, uh, you know, Google, you know, speaking you know, for a moment on behalf of, of my employer, um, Google has never uh, had a problem with the idea of going after foreign rogue websites. And in fact, we have from the beginning communicated to members of Congress that we would support legislation to try to deal with that particular problem. Now, I agree with Mark. There are a lot of tools in the US legal arsenal to go after even foreign sites. Um, but there are some sites that are beyond the reach of US courts. Um, and there is the DMCA passed in 1998, uh, did not have any provis provisions in it dealing with payment providers or adver advertising networks, uh, things of that kind. Um, so we did, we've always thought that there is room uh, to make improvements to deal with foreign rogue sites. The problem in these bills is they are not at all limited to foreign rogue sites. Uh, and in fact, the remedies uh, are available against law-abiding US sites. Uh, and in the switch from Protect IP to SOPA, the remedies became uh, even less subject to any kind of due process constraints. So let me just focus on one as an example that I think galvanized a lot of people. Uh, and this is what I call the single strike termination notice that is in SOPA. This is section 103 of SOPA. This is the idea that any copyright owner or trademark owner can send a private notice to an ad network or payment processor uh, alleging that a site is dedicated to the theft of US property. Again, I want to emphasize this is a remedy that would be available against either domestic or foreign sites. So again, already we've, we've separated ourselves from the rhetoric of foreign rogue sites because this provision is available against US sites. There's nothing foreign limiting about 103. Uh, somebody can send a notice to an ad provider or a payment provider and that provider is required within five days to terminate that serv their services to the site that is named unless the site sends a counter notice. And frankly, even if the site sends a counter notice, there is a very broad immunity provision uh, also in SOPA that basically makes respecting counter notices completely optional. You can ignore the counter notices and section 104 of SOPA will basically give you broad immunity to do whatever you like. Uh, so, you know, you do the math, right? If you are particularly a small customer, a small uh, business uh, that relies on payments or ads for your uh, economic existence, Imagine you have a disgruntled customer. Imagine you become the latest target of some uh, uh, online group. Uh, anonymous springs to mind. Uh, or let's say you're a political site. One can imagine whether you're the Christian Coalition or Planned Parenthood or any uh, of a number of other political sites. You could imagine very easily being uh, uh, the target of a directed campaign. Google processes more DMCA takedown notices under existing law than I think any other company in the world. And in doing that, we have seen all of these kinds of abuses in that context. And here, just to emphasize, number one, under existing law under the DMCA, we don't have to process a DMCA takedown notice. If we look at the site and we say, oh, this is bogus, there's no infringement here, we don't need to t accept the notice because we don't need the safe harbor because we're not liable for anything because the site's innocent. SOPA doesn't provide that freedom to service providers. You are required. The law says you shall terminate. You don't get to second guess or you, know, you are required to do it as separately as an obligation under pain of potentially being sued if you don't. Um, so that's the first difference. The second difference is under the DMCA, if someone sends a takedown notice for a particular page on your website, that's just one page on your website. You don't lose all your payment processing for the whole site all your ads, um, these notices do that. So when you compare and contrast Protect IP, again, all of this happens without any court in involvement. Anybody can send these notices. It is true there's a counter notice that you can send. So everybody has to keep an eye on their inbox for all time because if five days slips by and you didn't catch that counter notice, you could be out of business. And counter notices, as I mentioned, are sort of optional for service providers to accept. 
And there are, there are remedies that if someone misrepresents in a termination notice, you can sue them. And I ask you how many small businesses online want to be in the business of hiring lawyers to try to find anonymous trolls who are sending these termination notices to harass your business. So that's not, none of that's in Protect IP. And so from our view, that was a major uh, shift in the focus of the statute. Uh, we also think the definitions in the bills are unfortunately overbroad. As I said, the rhetoric is these bills are aimed at foreign rogue websites. Uh, in my view, that means it should be sites that are foreign <laughs> and sites that are breaking the law. Uh, unfortunately, the definitions are broader than that. They include sites that are domestic, and they also include sites that are violating no existing law. And here, it's interesting to look at the definitions. Rather than say the site is dedicated to or primarily used for violating copyright or relevant counterfeiting statutes, which themselves include indirect liability provisions. In other words, we already know that if you induce infringement, you can be liable for it. Contributory infringement, vicarious liability. The law has lots of doctrines that are intended to catch people who are quote unquote facilitating infringement. But the definitions don't say that. The definitions don't say if you are dedicated to violating the law, including the existing secondary liability doctrines. Instead, they say, you, should be, you can be a site dedicated to infringement if you enable or facilitate the violation of a law. And if you put the definition together that way, the judge says, well, Congress must have meant something beyond existing doctrines. Because if Congress meant inducement and contributory and vicarious and the stuff we all know, there's no need for the words enable and facilitate to be in the definition. Uh, and yet there they are. Uh, so from our perspective, that was one where, frankly, both Protect IP and SOPA suffer from a similar defect. Protect IP went even a little further by making willful blindness, or at least one concept of willful blindness. The definition says, uh, I, mean, I should read the language because it's a wonderful piece of DC writing. Uh, it's the kind of thing you only catch, uh, only a, 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 you know, Lawmaker could, even not a lawmaker could love this. Only a lawyer could love this. Um, if the operator of the US directed site is taking or has taken deliberate actions to avoid confirming a high probability of the use of the site to carry out acts that constitute a violation of copyright law. So if you have taken deliberate actions to avoid confirming a high probability, you can be a site dedicated to theft of US property. Um, now that's crazy for a number of reasons. One, I, that bends your mind to try to figure out what that possibly could have meant. Um, number two, that is a partial recapitulation of what some courts have viewed as willful blindness. Willful blindness has never been unlawful under existing copyright law or counterfeiting. Here it's copyright. It's willful blindness is one way to show knowledge, which can be one element that is necessary in order to establish liability. In other words, this is sort of one thing that if you do several other things, you could be liable under existing law. But under this law, you would be at, you know, dedicated to theft of US property for just this one thing. Um, and frankly, if you look at this language, um, Frank, a lot of copyright owners would argue that every user-generated content site has a, quote, high probability of use for <clears throat> copyright infringement. So would this clause require you effectively to monitor? Because if you don't monitor, then you took an action to deliberately avoid confirming the high probability. Um, these are the sorts of things that, in our view, as I said, Protect IP already suffers from some of these problems. It does not just target foreign sites. It does not just target rogue sites that are violating the law. Protect IP was one thing. SOPA goes even further by basically uh, letting the remedies be available to even more people with even less due process. So, so let me so, okay, can I just jump in for one jump thing. In. So I, I agree with everything that has been said about the problems with SOPA. I disagree with one thing, which is why it has taken SOPA to, for technology companies to jump in because uh, I think to argue that technology companies have jumped in because SOPA is so much worse than PIPA, I think the reality is technology companies have been largely apolitical and focused on building shit that people use. Yeah. Um, there was a predecessor to PIPA which was called Koika. Koika. And if you look at my blog, I wrote about why Koika was a bad idea and that was way back. 
So uh, this has been sort of coming at us for quite some time, and I think it, we have to sort of fess up that we sort of waited and waited and waited. Uh, uh, you know, one of my favorite cartoons from the financial crisis was two guys standing on a Wall Street sign, and there's this wave building and building and building, and eventually washes over them. They're completely drenched, and they stand there. One turns to the other and say, I didn't see that coming. So I, this is kind of the same situation. And uh, it's good that we are really throwing ourselves into high gear now, but I think we could have and should have done that quite a while ago. So Fred, let me, let, me, let me pick out a couple of things you mentioned. One was there are some sites that are beyond the reach of US law, so on some level, you didn't use these words, you need a new weapon to go after those. So if, if you're in favor of the particular weapon that SOPA, choose, SOPA chooses, you might say, yes, we need a new weapon. And uh, yes, it's targeted towards service providers or search engines. Uh, and maybe there is even some duty to monitor. I don't know. But what I want to explore is, uh, is, is, is the obligation imposed on search engines, for instance, really that big? I mean, you know, if you get an order, it identifies the link, it identifies the site, you kill the link, how hard is that? Well, just to be clear, currently today, a copyright owner can, you know, copyright owner has a power nobody else in the world has. A copyright owner can line edit Google. Right. You do a search, you find a link that's infringing, you send us a takedown notice, we take it out of search. Um, you know, nobody else has that magical power to basically line edit the results they don't like. The difference that this bill does is rather than having to identify the pages that infringe your copyrights, the idea here is we would get court orders that would knock out entire domains. Uh, and that, in my view, is a substantial change. Uh, all copyright owners, let me emphasize, Copyright owners already have the ability under existing law to remove every infringing link from search. Not just for domestic sites, also for foreign sites. We will take those links out of search. What you can't do is say, we don't like this domain, take everything from the domain out of search. Um, and that's sort of an important point, and this goes together in my view, it's not just about search, it's site blocking and search removal. Those are the two remedies that both Protect IP and SOPA would grant to the Attorney General, the US government would have the ability to do site removal, and uh, site blocking and search removal. From my perspective, the problem there is not so much would that be impossible technically to do. Sure, we could do it. Um, the problem there is the precedent that sets for the rest of the world. For the United States government to say to the world, when we have a problem, the first thing we do is we reach for site blocking and search removal, that's not a precedent I think we should be setting. The MPAA in the uh, testimony that we had uh, earlier, well, in the middle of November, uh, proudly trumpeted that, you know, this is the DNS blocking's no big deal because 16 countries already do it. And I was like, well, I'd love to see that list of 16 countries, and then I'd like to ask whether we should be volunteering to join that list. And that, for us, that's an important thing. Not, you know, other countries will do this to us in retaliation. Maybe for copyright, maybe for violation of some other domestic law. Let's say the Attorney General decides to get an order to block Baidu for United States users. Let's say they get an order to block Yandex for US users, both of which have been accused of being too lax on piracy. Do you think the Chinese government and the Russian government are just going to sit idly by and not say, well, if you can do that to our internet companies, we can do the same thing to your internet companies. Right? This is not the first thing we should be doing, particularly because it's not going to work. Uh, this is not the first new weapon we should be picking up proudly and using. So, so let me pick that up and, and move down to Albert, who's, who's started companies here and in Europe. Uh, your firm works with young companies that are innovating around content, so you're not just worried about one company, uh, you're not just worried about what's happening today, you're looking years down the road. So tell me what you're worried about here and why. So uh, at Union Square Ventures, I think you know, one of our fundamental convictions is that one of the things that the internet is doing is replacing sort of traditional hierarchical systems with networks. And um, that these networks will be incredibly powerful at solving lots of problems. So um, for instance, we've recently made a number of investments in education, where there are networks emerging where people are sharing educational content that they're creating and making it available often for free. Um, 
that obviously constitutes a huge benefit to society because now many people can access educational materials for free that were previously inaccessible uh, or um, cost prohibitive. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, there are um, large corporations that today make a very significant profit of copyrighted materials in those areas. Um, the US college textbook market, for instance, and that's just college, it's not high school, not graduate school, is $17 billion annually. Um, a big part of our investment premise is that that market uh, a few years from now will be maybe $1.7 billion or maybe $700 million, and uh, instead there will be a, just a, a profusion of free, high quality free educational content. Um, in our investing, we try to invest in services that um, power the creation of this type of content and that hopefully will have some economics of this, albeit potentially much reduced economics um, in terms of the overall scale. But the balance of this accrues to society, what economists would call consumer surplus. So what we fear is that it will be impossible to, for these startups to get off the ground because Early on, as Fred mentioned, um, in the life of almost any UGC company, there will also be content, copyrighted content, that will make its way in there. And we have an existing mechanism today that allows for startups to grow, which is the DMCA mechanism. <coughs> but if we replace that with a site-wide shutdown mechanism, these sites, and this would have included YouTube, which, by the way, is an amazing educational resource. Um, uh, daughter of a friend of mine learned how to play the guitar entirely off YouTube to the extent where school teachers at music school kept insisting to the parents that they did not believe <coughs> there was no music teacher involved. Um, so sites like YouTube um, and other sites uh, yet to be created um, face the potential of shutdown and never existing. And of course, from the perspective of an investor, um, there are many risks you're willing to take, um, but wholesale risk of um, incumbents um, whose economics are being attacked, having a mechanism that allows wholesale shutdown is probably not one of the risks people are willing to face. Well, so I, th I think a lot of proponents of SOPA say, look, you know, you, you, you give me this parade of horribles about how this is going to destroy innovation and how we have to protect it and keep it, keep it open, but, but, but how exactly will the specific terms of SOPA cause the damage you're talking about? How is SOPA going to stop all of these wonderful things from happening? Well, I think Fred cited the, the, the one of the several critical passages in here, which is it is completely shifting um, the, the, both the mechanisms for how shutdowns occur and, and, and how somebody can protest a shutdown. And they're changing the level of the shutdown from shutting down an individual piece of content to the entire site. And they shift what the site's potential responsibility. So um, a lot of these companies get started by very few people um, because one of the things the internet has done is it has made it possible to start things almost for free. So there are many startups in our portfolio that were created by one or two people originally that got to hundreds of thousands of users with one or two people. If those one or two people were spending their time monitoring all the content that flows through the system, they wouldn't be creating the system in the first place. So um, it is taking a current setup that ha makes it possible for literally thousands of new of these services to be created um, by very few people, often people with great ideas, and putting something in place where the cost for trying to create the service in the first place that we have just worked so hard to reduce would suddenly go back up because now you're spending all your time <coughs> trying to monitor activity um, on the off chance that something bad might be happening. So, so I, I want to I want to get Josh in on this, but before I do that, um, I, I think I want to talk to David and Paul a little bit about some of the technical issues. So, you know, you guys have literally devoted your careers to improving the internet. Um, it, DNS blocking is one of the most controversial parts of SOPA. So, I want to hear from you guys. Um, number one, what your concerns are about that particular mechanism. But I also, uh, as you discuss that, I also want to hear your thoughts on whether it's actually going to be effective in stopping traffic to these sites specifically. Um, and in general, from a, a, a technology perspective, whether you think that that approach or the others, the other mechanisms and so forth, are likely to be effective in reducing or stopping piracy online. 
I'll give, I'll give a, a first uh, first stab at responding, but uh, Paul is uh, one of the smartest, certainly the smartest technical person in this room, but uh, one of the smartest people I've met. So I'm going to let him, I'm going to try to speak about DNS uh, when I'm in the same room as him. Uh, one of the things that I will say is that, uh, you know, this, this bill, as a, we're a service provider, we have between 30 and 40 million users every day using our network. Comcast has about 17 million subscribers. So the effect that we have when we, if we were to filter things or block things would be, uh, think roughly two times the size or a little bit larger than Comcast, so we're not, we're not small. Uh, and our, the, the actions that we take have a big ramification and a big effect on people. One of the things that we've learned, uh, thanks to people like Fred uh, and Mark, is that you know, the, the deck is stacked for service providers so that we have to take action. And if we don't, we sort of have this unlimited liability. And if we do take action, we are completely immune. The problem is that if you look at the track record of ICE, which is, I forget what they stand for, the Homeland Security people that enforce something Immigra not good. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. Yeah, so ICE are some, is one of the parties that helps take down domain names. They have not had a flawless record in doing that. And the problem for us is that if we are now the recipients of some list from the Department of Justice or whoever it may be, and they make a mistake, Let's say they name a site that is not infringing and is very popular, uh, and we block it because we have to block it. The, the, the deck is so stacked that we would have to block it. We can't give our own judgment and say, hey, this is clearly a mistake. We're not, that's not our position to be in because the legislation makes it clear that that's not our place to be, uh, as the DMCA currently is, says that it could be. We can, we can overrule and say, hey, we think we're safe here. Uh, that we would do that, but the, the harm, we're not immune from our customers just leaving wholesale. And it, you know, it may take days for the list to get fixed or for the, the mistake. How long did it take for Roja Direct to get fixed? Still waiting uh, <laughs> 10 and a half months later. Okay, so 10 and a half months. So you know, if our service were to block access to Google for 10 and a half months, we would have zero customers at the end of that. Uh, so that, so there, there are fundamental problems with this legislation. The burden that they've placed on us as a, as a service provider is super onerous. As to whether or not it will be effective, uh, one thing that I think has not been mentioned and uh, again, I'm not the lawyer here, and people like Fred are, but the DNS is the, the way that they're sort of enumerating what they want blocked. They're just giving you a list of domain names. But the means by which service providers have to do the blocking is not limited to DNS. Is that, that accurate? They have to take any means necessary, any reasonable means necessary. Well, the, the worst part of that is that the easiest way to block things are often the most crude tools, right? It's the sledgehammer versus the scalpel. And so service providers will just block IPs wholesale, or they can take any, they, or worse, they'll have to invest money in deep packet inspection things, which may or may not be possible. But if it is possible, it's far worse that they add these intermediary devices into the network. Uh, and we can talk about the security problems that are created with that uh, later if we have time. But generally, service providers want to do the least amount of work possible to comply with legislation. And the problem with that is that they will create very crude tools that will have very significant collateral damage. And this has been shown, actually, in, in, in their, there's evidence, and not just the Roja Direct ones, uh, but that, you know, for example, Blogger hosts thousands of blogs. Not all of them are infringing. If one or two are infringing, why should that shut down all of Blogger? Doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then as a startup and as an entrepreneur, you know, we, you know, like Albert was saying, we started our company with technologists and with engineers. We now are fortunate to be a slightly larger company where we can afford to, unfortunately, we, we are in the position where we unfortunately pay a lot of lawyers. Uh, but we, we would never have been able to do that and get off the ground if we were so burdened and customers would not have chosen our service. Uh, and the last thing I'll say before I hand it off to Paul uh, is that, you know, to me, the best deterrent for copyright infringement uh, piracy is really innovation. So, I mean, I can sort of speak personally. You know, if I had ever contemplated stealing a song, which I probably never did, but if I ever contemplated it, iTunes made that contemplation go away. Uh, I buy my music on iTunes. It's so much easier to do. Uh, it made it simple. I'm a customer of Netflix streaming. I wish they had more movies there. It seems like they're having some kind of licensing problems getting all the movies. Uh, I hope they get that worked out. If they don't, then they're not a viable alternative. Uh, I think Congress maybe should focus on making that stuff happen. Uh, but really, you know, another thing is, you know, technology takes time to catch up with what, what sort of old models has. Old models need to evolve with technology. And if you think of things like the DCR, which the Motion Picture Association used to equate to the Boston Strangler, uh, I think now if they were to look backwards, they would say that the VCR created unbelievable economic uh, results for them. I can't speak for them, but if, I, I would guess that they're super stoked by the VCR. Uh, I think the DVR is another example, the MP3 player, the player piano. I mean. It does take time. Sometimes technology is disruptive, and that's been a great thing. But it does take time sometimes for old models to evolve. And ultimately, I think generally people find that those old models evolve into something that makes 
you know, the, the, the conquerors at the end far, far greater returns. I'll hand it off to you, Paul. Thank you, David. Um, so first I want to say I've been working on trying to keep DNS alive and make it uh, thrive for most of the last 21 years. Um, most of that time has been spent either writing code or writing internet RFC documents or starting companies that employ a lot of other people that write that code and, and do those sorts of things. Um, for the last year, it's taken the form of worrying about this. Uh, COICA, PIPA, SOPA, Protect IP. Um, I've spent some time in the, inside the Beltway talking to the people who live and work there about this problem. Um, it is a uh, conflict of interest for me. I am arguing against my own economic interests. I will tell you that as uh, chairman and founder of a technology company in the DNS field, we stand to make a lot of money if this thing goes through because everybody in the business is going to be paying us, among other people, for the technology they will need to enforce this stuff. Uh, nevertheless, it is a bad idea in spite of uh, how much money it would mean to me, uh, to my company. Um, I want to explain why. Um, but I don't want you to get the impression that the internet is some waif-like small furry animal that must be protected and that the people in this room had better make sure that that thing doesn't get run over. Uh, that's not the situation. If this were physics, the internet would be a wave, not a particle. It's an idea, it's a vision, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's an ideal in some ways. The internet breaks every day and gets fixed and rebuilt every day. What it is on any particular day is whatever we were able to make work on that particular day. So I'm not worried that uh, this legislation goes through and breaks the internet, because that doesn't happen. Historically speaking, that never happens. Something comes along, some external factor like this comes along, and the internet adapts. So when I start to consider the collateral damage to the internet or to the internet ecosystem uh, of this legislation, I'm not thinking that the internet is going to be damaged by it. I'm thinking that all of us are going to be damaged by what the internet will have to become if this thing goes through. Um, can I have a laser pointer? So, um, I made a slide because not everyone in this room is a technologist. I want to uh, dispel a few myths and explain a few things. Um, on the left here, we have this big box full of content. This is the DNS's equivalent of web servers and things like that. I've shown how we structure the name system in a way that www.stanford.edu can, can work. That's probably how you found the map to this place. Um, this system you know, hangs together very well. It's pretty well managed uh, overall. And it speaks to a whole bunch of these recursive name servers that are operated by folks like David Ulovich. Google DNS operates one. Every ISP operates quite a few. Enterprise, uh, every dorm uh, on this school has its own, etc. There are about 15 million of these. Uh, there are probably less than 2 million of these uh, servers that make up that sort of thing. Now, talking to these guys, we have you, uh, your laptops, your tablets, your smartphones, your PCs at home. And so it's a fairly simple information uh, ecosystem. It, the information starts out here, flows through here, flows down here, gets used to find web servers, uh, essentially. And I know it's used for other things besides the web, but statistically, it's the web. Um, what is contemplated by this legislation is all going to take place here. And that means uh, anybody down here who's talking to a server who implements this sort of thing is going to see less internet after the legislation goes through than they're seeing today. Now there's um, quite a bit of argumentation on the pro-SOPA, pro-PIPA side that uh, they're really only trying to stop accidental infringement. In other words, there are all these websites out there selling movies. They don't look like pirate websites. People think they're not breaking the law. I don't believe that. I also don't believe that any data has been presented that justifies that claim. I also believe that I have seen plenty of data that uh, make, makes that claim absurd. Um, but if you believe that claim, then you would believe that if we stop David and Google and everybody else from making these websites reachable, that these folks will simply never see them. They'll say, oh, I really do have to pay $50 for that. I, I can't get it for 50 cents. What a, what a shock. Uh, okay, 
I personally don't think that's going to happen, and I could back that up with facts. Send me email, I'll, I'll share them with you. Um, I think what they're going to do is they're going to, I didn't draw it here, but there's an other, there are other recursive name servers, believe it or not. Uh, of those 15 million, about half are not inside the United States, and therefore that half is, are not going to have to comply with this legislation at all, not subject to U.S. law. The other U.S. law they're not subject to is the one that would require them to actually give you the IP address of your bank if you ask them what is the IP address of www.mybank.com. Uh, in America, if you give them the wrong address and then you steal their passwords, you probably get arrested. If you're not in America, not subject to U.S. law, you might get away with that all day long, and in fact they do. So as we incentivize these infringers to go offshore with their DNS traffic, I think that our economy becomes less safe. That's sort of a general economic conditions argument. It's uh, difficult to sort of point a finger to the paragraph of this legislation that is bad for that reason, but it, it leads clearly to that, in that direction. The other thing that can happen is that these folks, uh, it's clearly not in EDU, but off here in .com, you might have a, you know, some site that's in you know, Hungary or wherever, and they are currently on you know, example1.com, and we go through this process, and the uh, attorney general does what they have to do, and the ISPs do what they have to do, and we block example1.com. It only takes these guys about 30 seconds to switch over to example2.com, and they have all kinds of other ways to make their customers aware of example2.com than to use the search engines that will also be blocked. So. We really don't think that blocking a domain name would stop them, either because the users can pick a different name server to use, a different one of these recursives, or the publisher of the infringing content can quickly pick a different domain name to use. So one way or another, this becomes, becomes kind of a, a weird, stupid game that leads nowhere except to added costs for everybody. By the way, I would make a lot of that money. Um, so. The last thing I want to get to is about DNS security, um, because some of the pro-PIPA, pro-COICA, pro-SOPA folks have said uh, that DNS security it won't be affected by this. And you know probably there's some weird way of looking at it where that would be true, because DNS security right now is only practiced here and here. Um, in other words, we're not, we're not doing DNS security in your web browser today. However, DNS security has taken us 16 years to get to the point where it now is, and a lot of that time was spent arguing with people inside the Washington Beltway because they didn't understand it, didn't want to take the risk of having been the one to approve something that melted the internet or whatever, but we did eventually get the root sign, this thing up here. Uh, politically, this is the hottest potato you'll ever see. Uh, we got all of these signed, we've got most of these signed. I don't know if uh, Stanford is signed, but I know Harvard is. Um, and that means if the owners of those domains publish something, then other people in the world can prove with uh, crypto authenticity that it is true. It is that, that information did not come from a pirate, a poisoner, a, a man in the middle. It's absolutely true. Now, the uh, cost of, of that 16 years has also been borne by the overall internet economy. And we got a lot of that money too, but uh, not all of it. Um, it's been a huge amount of money, and the amount of money that has been spent would not be justified by only doing DNS validation here. We're going to have to do it in your web browsers. We're going to have to make it possible for you to go to Starbucks or whatever is the coffee shop of choice and ask it, okay, what is the IP address of my bank and what is the security key I should be using to trust the website and all the rest of that sort of thing, and have you have some reason to believe it. Now, right now, Trusting your coffee shop to make a secure introduction to your bank would be crazy. In fact, your coffee shop would say, don't do that because we don't want to be sued if we give you the wrong answer. So we really need to take the coffee shop out of the business of uh, teaching you who your bank is. And we're going to be doing that unless this legislation goes through. Because this legislation is going to happen right here in the middle and is going to keep anybody down here from ever seeing any kind of DNSSEC data, or if they do see it, They'll be in the position of saying, okay, the signature's wrong. I got told that this didn't exist, or I got told that the IP address is this funny FBI web server that's going to give me the warning about the content. But the signature was wrong, because the signature in DNSSEC terms can only come from the person whose name it really is. And in this case, 
the content will be coming from the FBI, the, the, the Attorney General. They won't have the signature. So they're going to be doing exactly what the bad guys would be doing if they were trying to poison your DNS. So you are in the odd position of saying, well, I know it's a lie. Maybe it's a government-mandated lie. Maybe I'm supposed to believe it anyway. Okay, we didn't put any signaling into DNSSEC. It never occurred to us 16 years ago. By the way, governments might want to lie, and we need to support that. Frankly, if somebody had brought that up, my first thought would have been China, because China really wants to be able to lie to their citizens and get away with it, and they do. And then the citizens do all kinds of weird things to get around that. Uh, I don't want to be like them. I don't want us to be like them. Um, anyway, we can talk more about this in Q&A if detailed questions about technology come up. But I'm looking around the room, I'm not sure that's going to happen. <laughs> I want to get back to Josh because he's been so patient uh, and, and has lots uh, to add here. So, and Josh, I want to steer you back to the question I asked Albert, which, which is, um, tell me about the concerns you have about how SOAP is going to affect things now. Um, and in the future, but also where this goes as a policy matter, because I know you've become, have been for a while, very active on the policy side. So I want to talk to you about the impact of SOPA now and later, but also where it goes on the trajectory uh, in terms of what policy is being made. Yeah, that's great. And I always hesitate to use this term in a law school, but the chilling effects of this legislation are really what, what scare me as, a, as an entrepreneur in a previous career and, and in my job now. And, uh, and when you really think about it, you know, I, I like to envision the scenario in which, as human progress has occurred, it's always about the networked exchange of information. And then you kind of work down from there. It's the networked exchange of goods and the networked exchange of, of people. And, um, and so this isn't, it's not just about SOPA. It's not just about PIPA, but really a, a continuous process that we're going to face in Washington where there's simply a lack of understanding and, uh, and knowledge about the spaces in which great companies are being built in this country and, and frankly around the world. And um, so at least what personally I'm, I'm worried about is what happens that day when you've got a bunch of, of people in a room and, uh, and they have a, an idea that they think can truly be revolutionary and it very well might not, very well may be, um, but then the second they really start processing it or they go to their first advisor or they go to their first investor to try to make the pitch, and, uh, and that person has to go, well, you're crazy. Or worse, they go, yeah, it's a really great idea, but you better go move outside the United States and get this going. And, uh, and that's absolutely going to happen. So look, I'm, I'm not an attorney. I, I can't speak to, to the specifics of the legislation and, and certainly not to the specifics of where it's going and some of these proposals that, um, that some of the House staff have, have at least talked to me about uh, that, are, that are soon to emerge, which I, at least as, as, as they've been explained are great. But, I would sort of say there, there are two pieces here, one of which is that there is a legitimate concern. And um, I hate saying that, but there is something that we in the tech community have not done right. And when it gets to the point where you, know, you have members of Congress and frankly their staffs who are, who are successfully lobbied of, hey, we really do have to do something, it's a failure on our part. And, um, and so it, it, Albert kind of alluded to this. This has been building for a while. And, and this is about copyrighted content, but uh, it's not just about that. And there are going to be more, and we already know that there are additional things. Um, OK, so let's, let's kind of, of move, move forward from there. Uh, looking at SOPA and PIPA, we know that you're going to have that chilling effect in the content space, also in the payment space, where there's a lot of disruption and a lot of really innovative companies. Uh, well, what do you do about it? And I would propose two things. One. Is, is the clear and obvious choice, and there is something very practical we're, we're starting to do about it. So tomorrow night, um, it, it happens to have aligned really well with, with uh, the community rallying around SOPA, but we are launching an organization that we've called Engine Advocacy. And the members of the steering committee of Engine Advocacy are a series of entrepreneurs in their own right and their investors. And our entire focus is on both educating policymakers in Washington, but perhaps more importantly, educating individuals within our own community. Because as an entrepreneur, you want to be spending all of your time building your product and making your product successful. You don't have the time, the patience, the energy, or the expertise to be worrying about what's going on in the Hill or in Sacramento or wherever. Let's even say Geneva. And, uh, and so the, the core of Brussels, sorry, thank you. Both of them. <laughs> yeah, truthfully, yeah. Uh, so anyway. Following from that, it's this notion of, okay, fine, well, let's come together, let's, 
let's get educated on this and let's educate others. Uh, we call that indigent advocacy. It's, uh, it's a loose coalition of these groups, the, the sole point being let's know what's going on and let's get in front of it. And so when you get down that path, you realize, well, not only is there a little bit of, okay, well, we're going to do fly-ins, we're going to talk to members of Congress, we're going to educate staffs, we're going to bring members to go meet with amazing tech companies in their districts, you can actually get to a point where you ask yourselves, well, what are the things that we can do that are fundamentally innovative that get in front of some of these problems? So Google, who I'll use as an example here, and YouTube have built some amazing fingerprinting technologies that get in front of a lot of, a lot of infringement. That's great stuff. We have not been talking about things like that. And sure, like poor Google, and I'm sorry, right, is in a lot of, the, a lot of crosshairs on the hill, and we know that. Um, but the truth is there are others. And when you are working as an investor, or you're working as an advisor, or as an entrepreneur, and you can kind of spot these opportunities, and you have folks willing to help you and willing to engage and say, hey, look, there really is a market here, and this is what your market looks like, uh, you're going to have really great innovation. Come. At least I'd, I'd like to think. But you certainly don't want to have that innovation imposed upon any of us by government will. And that's where we're going. And I, I think you know, sort of both David and Paul have, have spoken to that. We're actually going to have the innovation. Um, this legislation, in a lot of ways, is, is, is going to be a lot, waste of a lot of people's time and a lot of energy. The boon, I would ultimately argue, is going to be for law firms. But the, the simple reality exists that why are we going down this path? Why are we wasting a lot of energy? Let's just get in front of it, and uh, and I think we can. And so, you know, maybe I'll I'll just end, if you don't mind, Tony, with a with a quick pitch for Engine. I think there are a lot of people in this room, and my guess is you're only in this room because you are interested in technology, the companies that are built on on the internet and others. And uh, and I would encourage you, you know, come find me. I've got a, a colleague of mine, uh, Mike, in the back there. Talk to us about Engine. You know, there there are also a number of others. David's involved. Um, and uh, we'd love to talk about what we're doing. We'd love to have you involved. We'd love to have your companies and your firms involved uh, because we really do want to make sure that we can stay in front of these issues and, uh, and make sure that everyone understands the reality and through information and education get in front of it. Is that that's your question? That's absolutely. Um, and I want to I finish with uh, a question or maybe a series of questions that I think might turn out to be the hardest. Um, and they, they center around what to do. Um, people on every side of this debate all acknowledge piracy is a big problem and something has to be done. And the question becomes what? Well, we've presented reasons why it's not this. And the next question is, OK, if then, what? So one, idea, so one question is, can this basic approach be fixed or amended? Um, another question is whether the proposal that's coming forth tomorrow from uh, six Congress people and four senators or whatever the count is that uses the International Trade Commission as, as, the, uh, as the neutral third party who is in charge of uh, choosing to enforce or not enforce or enjoin or not enjoin. Is that a good solution so long as it doesn't involve some of the DNS blocking? Um, what are your thoughts about where we push in terms of an actual solution or at least part of the solution well, to the problem? I, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to give a five second answer which is that it's not I'm going to speak for myself here. I'm sure they're going to give more eloquent answers. It's not my job to solve their problems, right? And that's something I think people often forget. It's my job to build my business, right? And it's their job to innovate, you know, evolve them, their models. And there's lots of entrepreneurs, especially in the tech community, that want to help them. Uh, you know, going down the road of litigation is not something where I'm going to ever pro-offer. You know, compromise often results in everyone sort of being unhappy. Uh, you know, my job is to build a great service to fall within and color within the lines of the law and to do that, uh, you know, as best I can. I think it's, we have, when we talk to Congress, when we, when we talk to folks, they ask, well, what is the right solution? Well, the right solution is for them to come up with the right solution. And I think we can be helpful there uh, in some ways, but that's not, that's not my job, right? My job is not to fix their broken model uh, or the model that they're not willing to evolve or whatever, it is, whatever their issues are. Um, I mean, they still make a lot more money than, than I do. So, so, so oh, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, well, so I, mean, I, I actually, I, so I think the right answer is quite clear. It's also the one that is perhaps hardest for Congress to hear. It is, don't just do something, stand there. Right? Congress wants to act. That's what they do. They're in the business of enacting things, right? right. And so the message that says the thing to do is lay off, just leave the laws alone to work, leave the economy alone to work, is a hard message for them to hear, but it's the right message. Um, you know, we are in the process, 
at various stages in various industries of adapting content to the digital environment. Music is getting there. You know, music's got business models. There's an explosion of new creativity and music going on. Video, I think, is starting to find its way there too. Um, you know, the newspaper and the publishing industries are still stuck in the maybe if we just try really hard, the internet will go away and it'll be back to the way it was in 1980. Uh, that's where music was 15 years ago. It's where uh, video was uh, uh, five years ago. Um, but the idea that so what we need to do is jump in and fix the internet, change the internet to make it safe for the content industries seems to me exactly backwards. I, I think we also need to start studying the things that do seem to be working, right? So um, a couple of examples of things that are working. Um, we're investors in a company called Kickstarter uh, on which a lot of artists are raising money to cut records, to um, put on concerts, etc. Um, so that's something that's working. It's a kind of a micro patronage. It's a very, very different model of how you can make money for content. That's one thing that's working. Another example of something that should be studied that is working is if you look at digital music, there are two fundamentally different models. There's the on-demand model and there's the internet radio model. The internet radio model has a mandatory licensing scheme that's imposed on the industry. Um, I can count the number <coughs> of startups that have succeeded in the on-demand business on basically with no fingers. Um, now, if I look at what's happening in internet radio, there is a profusion of new startups. Um, I have on this device, I have three apps from startups, two of them which have launched, a um, couple which have not yet launched, that are all new takes on what internet radio should look like. Why can they innovate? Because there's clear and firm legal basis for, on which they can innovate. They can predict exactly what their cost will be once they're up and running. Um, the UK government commissioned a study on copyright, um, I think a year ago, you guys probably know this better. Um, one of the recommendations that the study came back with was to explore extending mandatory licensing schemes, not just to internet radio, but also to on-demand play, uh, and put potentially to other media types, exactly because it provides the basis for innovation. So, so let me start by agreeing with both, uh, you know, both Mark and also uh, with everyone who said we're not going to enforce our way out of this problem, right? Enforcement alone is not going to magically make piracy disappear. As in all previous historical moments where this <coughs> has happened, the solution is get the legitimate stuff out there in a form that's more compelling than the illegitimate stuff. So I absolutely agree. Let's have more, uh, more services. Let's create licensing regimes that make it easier to start new businesses. Um, it's sort of ironic to hear you sing the praises of the webcasting compulsory because I still remember the days when Pandora was being threatened with litigation by the music labels, uh, despite the fact that Pandora was, at the time of its founding, almost the only company that was writing big checks on a regular basis to the music industry. <coughs> Nevertheless, they were a subject of a lot of, uh, uh, of threats and such. So uh, I agree that's the first and most important thing to do. Um, that said, we do also think there is some improvement that can be achieved legislatively here. As I said, we, we think following the money for the, uh, the money that supports foreign rogue sites is a sensible place to start. Um, it was quite successful in dealing with unlawful uh, offshore gambling uh, where it was done and you know, I, I will set aside the question if those of you who are upset that your poker playing days were uh, uh, hobbled by that. All I'm saying is it did, uh, it did work pretty well there, so we have some indications. Uh, frankly, Google and a lot of the payment processors already do a lot of these things voluntarily. Uh, and we look, we're going to keep doing, uh, taking steps to crack down on the use of our ad products and our payment services, uh, whether this legislation passes or not. But there are a lot of companies that have not been as scrupulous. And in fact, there are probably some members of the industry who are probably excited that the major players are pulling back and you know, saying, we've caught all these bad guys. We kicked them out, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's room for raising the, the, the kind of basic uh, uh, requirements around that issue. And we support, we've been very clear with members of the committee, we support that. And it's, all, it's no coincidence you know, ads is where Google makes its money. Uh, so we are volunteering, in essence, for a regulation that would help cut off the money that we think is supporting these offshore sites. 
So folks who are saying the internet companies are not willing to step up, the internet companies don't have solutions, the internet companies don't think this is a problem, they're not willing to put their bottom line at stake, all that stuff is false. Uh, and the same thing is frankly true for the payment processors, whether you're talking about Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, they've all been at the table and they've all said we will support legislation that focuses on trying to dry up the money that we know keeps these sites going. Because to go back to the example you used, it's very, very easy to go from uh, example1.com to example2.com. It's not necessarily as easy to try to go from payment processor number one to payment processor number two. Uh, and so we think there's a lot that can be done there. There's a lot else that can be done voluntary, in voluntary measures. I don't think we should think Congress alone is going to solve this problem. When was the last time Congress alone solved any problem? Right? There's a lot more that can be done. We've talked about budget deficit. Yeah, exactly. They solved that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, so, uh, so I think there's a lot of work that can be done, but for now, Congress's role, in our view, the, thing, the solution should be, let's do something to follow the money and dry up the money for the foreign side. So let's can get I be the one contrarian? I, I wanna, yeah, yeah, so let, let, wait, 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 let me get, let me get one I last thought from Paul, <laughs> and then I wanna make sure we leave time for questions. So let's get, let's get Paul's thought and then uh, okay. open up for questions. Thank you, I was also gonna be contrarian. Uh, I think we can enforce our way out of some of this problem. And I want to make sure we properly scope the problem. It is not just websites full of music and movies. Um, a lot of the premium brands in the world make a lot of money for the holders of those trademarks and of those logos and so forth. And uh, whenever somebody makes one and sells it uh, to somebody uh, who may or may not even know it's a fake, uh, then that's also a loss. That's, a, that's intellectual property that I think also deserves some protection. And the internet does facilitate all of this, and I helped build some parts of the internet, and I feel slightly responsible. On the other hand, um, I agree with David, this is not currently my problem. And, but I want to speak for many in the audience when I say I'm a technologist, my company is in the technology business. If you have this problem, you could potentially hire us to solve it for you, and we might be very interested in doing that. So to the extent that innovation is necessary, I am willing to put my, my shoulder to that wheel. I'm just not going to do it sort of uh, on, my own, uh, on my own time with my own money because at the moment this is not my problem. You know, that, that could be changed. Um, but the last point I want to make, um, payments and ads do work. I've done quite a lot of internet security work in about the last five or six years. And whenever you follow the money, uh, you can put somebody out of business. And so when we first started talking about Protect IP, I said, you know, the payment part of this is pretty well written and the advertising part of this is pretty well written. I'm not in the search business, so I'm, I'm not qualified to judge that. Um, but the, the, the DNS part is totally wrong, won't work. But the other two things, the, the payment provisions and the ad provisions would work. They have worked where they've been applied. And I think there's a lot of room for innovation there also. Right, these bad guys in some cases have been so successful that they now own banks. And those banks have access to the SWIFT system. I think that maybe a little bit of policing of the SWIFT system to deny these banks that are purely in the business of moving money for bad guys might do more good than anything you could ever do with the internet. So I, I, I got I to gotta do 30 okay. seconds. All right, I, so 30 it, seconds for Mark. I, there's something very dangerous going on here and I think it's intentional. Right. Um, if you throw a bunch of really terrible things into a bill, right, it's all too easy for the people who look at them to say, boy, you know, if we could just get it down to two really terrible things, the world would be a better place. Uh, and that's exactly what's going on here. It's no accident that after the public outcry from academics, from uh, technologists, from venture capitalists, from tech companies about Protect IP Act, we introduced SOPA and it was worse. Right? That's because they're throwing in a bunch of things that they can bargain away to get us down to just very, very bad. Um, and so I understand the way the legislative process works. And you know, it may be that some amount of that is inevitable. But you know, we need to think really carefully about whether we want the International Trade Commission uh, to jump in or whether we want credit card companies to cut off websites entirely because we think that's actually the right thing to do or because we think, boy, that's not as bad as all the other things that are in the bill. Uh, I, I, I would agree and I think, you know, um, uh, when we think politically what one will about WikiLeaks, but um, 
you know, we've talked earlier about the Pentagon Papers, and it's clear that you can, it's a very powerful mechanism that could very easily be abused. Just this totally. So let's, uh, let's get the audience involved with questions. We have one mic here, and I think we're about to have another one here. So um, come on down. Is there a restroom over there? Carl. Hi. We're uh, over here, too. I don't even know. If it, I'm Carl Auerbach, and I wrote on my tag, Troublemaker, because I am. Um, I really have uh, two points to make here. One is I want to reemphasize what Paul suggested, is that the corrective effects that people may take may have all kinds of repercussions that we don't understand. I am very concerned that we may end up splitting the internet namespaces or address spaces. That's the kind of thing that would just have be bad, but it could occur. We're squeezing the toothpaste tube and it's going to come out an unknown hole. But um, the troublemaker part of my bad, uh, badge here is I'm looking at this as a weapon. How can I use it to go against my competition, for example? Yeah. Um, I'm, there's going to be a new, whole bunch of new top-level domains, but the one that was, that's causing the most consternation right now is XXX. Why, do, why is this bringing down domain names only at the second level? Why couldn't I accuse XXX? Why couldn't I accuse .com? and cause an automatic takedown of all of .XXX, all of .com. Uh, is that sort of constraint written into the bill? Uh, how much of this bill can be used as a weapon? And that's kind of an open question to anyone, and it may be too open for an answer right now, but that's a concern I have. Well, I, I think that's a very valid uh, question to ask. Frankly, a lot of people who both are supporters and opponents of these bills, remember the site blocking and search removal remedies are reserved under either uh, Protect IP or SOPA to actions that are initiated by the Attorney General. Um, and a lot of people, I think, are just saying, well, you know, the Attorney General would never do something that would do that. Um, and so there is a lot of reliance on prosecutorial discretion on those remedies. And I tend to agree with you. That's a lot to load onto that plate. Uh, in my view, again, there's no indication that those measures will help. Uh, as we've heard, and as every technologist who I've asked certainly says, it's not hard to get around a DNS block. It's cheap for the site that wants to evade it. It's not hard to make people figure out that you were rohadirected.com on day one and rohadirected.es on day two. Um, so we, those will not work. They will set a dangerous precedent, and I agree with you. There's, there is risk that it could be used in uh, unexpected ways. Um, I'm not sure you could actually take down triple X or dot com. That actually would turn on whether or not you read the in definition of s internet site to include that. And I, I think, well, no reason wasn't, that wouldn't help, right? I mean, if the AG got an order that said dot triple X is a foreign infringing site, I don't, I don't think you could do that here because it's not a foreign site because foreign is defined as basically not uh, controlled by uh, VeriSign or, you know, not .com.edu. I think .XXX is in the U.S., right? I mean, it's the yeah. same entity. But so it wouldn't be a foreign site, but, so it's out well, for that reason. But, well, but I thought, .com is also out for that reason. It, it's a complex interpretation of the current bill. I read it to apply only to subdomains, um, though it's an interesting question. So let's get the next one. Thanks. I, I actually wanted to uh, play off Josh's closing point about education, because I believe it's not only a matter of educating Congress as it is about educating the public. That, that I'm not surprised we're here talking about this, and I expect us to be here having a similar conversation in three years or five years. And it's basically because traditionally copyright industries or <coughs> industries that rely on copyrights have gotten the bulk of their protection and built the bulk of their business around technological protection. Right? It used to be very expensive to buy a bunch of printing presses and carts that would take books around England. Right? That was where they got most of their protection from. And the law just gave them a thin stratum of additional protection from a small number of well-funded, technologically adept competitors. As technology erodes, we've got two choices, two, two coherent choices. We can either realign the rights that we're giving out, or we can increase, the, or we can put in place increasingly draconian enforcement efforts. Because the third state is to simply say, we're going to give you rights you can't enforce. This is such an important point that I think needs to be repeated over and over again. 
as the cost of the cr crime sinks, the cost of enforcement rises. And so um, this is absolutely critical. It has not been talked about nearly enough. Thanks. And that, that was actually, my question was, if you look over the past 12 years, right, when Napster came out, you could stop 10 people on the street, and nine of them would say, I don't see what the big deal about downloading music is. I, I, I want to sound a little note of uh, disagreement with this. Um, as the cost of uh, falls, it's also the case that, again, if you focus on enforcement, then you're right. But, when, but I would agree with exactly what you said. Once iTunes is easier, once Netflix has everything. Oh, but this, once is the, this is the quid pro quo for the right, right? If you are a copyright holder and the cost of enforcement has gone up, that's why you should be willing to agree to some licensing scheme, right? I mean, that's the, that's the whole making rights the society enforces on your behalf be attached to some quid pro quo. And I mean, we good, do that all the time the, with all rights. Right. And then the good news is there are lots and lots of innovators, content owners and technology companies alike, that are working hard to deliver those new, I mean, the thing I always say is Netflix and Spotify this year are going to make a far bigger dent on online piracy than anything Congress has ever done, right? I mean, that's just a fact. So uh, from my perspective, it's not a, uh, a, uh, I don't have this sort of hopeless uh, cynicism about copyright is doomed. I actually think quite the contrary. It seems like it's getting easier and easier to get what you want more easily and in a good value uh, from an authorized site than a not authorized site. And I think that trend hopefully will continue. I just don't see what this bill has to do with it. I didn't read the comment I, I at all as saying it's copyright is doomed. I, I, read, I heard this as saying licensing and creating Positive alternatives is the answer, not enforcing restrictions. Then we agree completely. Yeah, yeah I, I don't. I don't think the situation is hopeless. But, but I'm observing it. I'd like to get some feedback on why, in the war of ideas, over the past 10, 12, 15 years, the content holders have been very successful at convincing large parts of the public, including Congress, that they deserve better rights to protect what they were given, and the technologists have done a much poorer idea of making a. Well, I think because. It, I mean, the, you know, actually, some of them are here, so maybe they'll they'll tell us. But it is, you know, there's a lot of lawyers cranking a lot of typewriters to go after the infringers, and you would think that they would love that. But uh, I think it's, you know, it's hard, and they're now looking at. Nobody's brought it up today, but they're essentially not. You know, copyright generally was where the copyright holder would go after the infringer. They're now essentially putting the burden on intermediaries because it's it's too hard, right? The lawyers don't want to do this much work anymore, or whatever whatever the issue is. I think that's one of the issues is that. That because the infringement, as you pointed out, is easier now, you know, that it is, it, there's more people doing it or whatever they think is the case. But I don't know if that's true. I don't know if more people are doing it. Maybe they just have ways of tracking it better. I don't know. But that they, that they now are trying to hold other people responsible to fix their problems. And that's actually, I think, and there's other people that are lawyers that can talk about it. I think that's actually the opposite of why copyright was even invented in the first place, that it was to give the person who created it not have to go through an intermediary to solve their problem, but to go directly to the infringer. But I think other people talk. So we got a long line uh, on both sides. I want to make sure we, we work through it at least as far as we can. So let's go back over here to you. Hi, uh, my name is Jim Fenton. Uh, question primarily for Paul. Uh, if the point of enforcement is the recursive name server, is one of the possible outcomes that a lot of people will set up recursive name servers? Maybe they'll have recursive name servers in people's home routers and things like that. And if so, uh, well, if you could comment on that generally and whether that would have an effect on the authoritative side of DNS, uh, an adverse effect there? So I think, um, yes, it is. Uh, that's one of the places that the toothpaste will come out uh, is more recursive name servers, uh, and not just the offshore ones. We'll see people operate their own. And I don't think that this legislation could credibly try to enforce any kind of restrictions on a personal name server the way they could uh, on David, who's in the business, or an ISP. Um, so yes, that'll be one of the places uh, where relief occurs. Even if the number of recursive name servers were to double or triple, it would not affect the stability of the authority system. Let's go back over to the right, please. I have a quick question about, uh, it looks like uh, we are getting more and more of these appalling uh, bills of abuse to, uh, and I was wondering if there is a, a more direct way for general public to oppose or to provide some alternative uh, ways without having to go through all these different steps. 
and if uh, <coughs> maybe some website where you gather signatures, that's, uh, but it's probably not very effective right now. Do you see something like that uh, coming up, kind of more power powerful uh, uh, sort of distributed network uh, in the future. Thank you. Yes, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, right. <laughs> well, or, or look, I mean, this is what, what's one of the things that's notable about SOPA is there has been a real public outcry of attention here. A million people uh, have signed uh, online petitions to Congress about this. I mean, that's a, I don't think a million people have expressed an opinion to Congress about all of the copyright laws since 1790 combined, right? Uh, I mean, that's a pretty astonishing thing. And so, um, and people hear that message, right? I mean, uh, I think it's no accident that um, Zoe Lofgren and Anna Eshoo and Nancy Pelosi, who are here in Silicon Valley, have all lined up in opposition to this. Uh, Ron Wyden says he's going to uh, uh, filibuster the bill in the Senate uh, and read the names of all of the opponents who've been submitted to him. So it's not, um, it, it, I would only political add, participation it, 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 in Congress it, it, is a messy it, process, but it can, it can it, happen. It's interesting, though, because it, it goes back to this earlier point. The million people here now because the tech companies have woken up and have taken some of their traffic and pointed in this direction. So for instance, um, Tumblr, which is one of our portfolio companies, had this little thing where you, when you logged into your Tumblr dashboard, which millions of people do every day, they had this little thing say, call your rep about this. And they, at peak, generated about four calls per second to house. Um, so I think you need to get that flywheel going um, where you educate people about it and where you show them how they can act um, so that you can get to the many millions of people. And prior to this, um, the other side had been quite effective at collecting signatures. And, and let me, oh, I, I mean, let including me, the firefighters, which I didn't. Know. Yeah, let me just say very quickly, entirely on my, this is my personal view, it has nothing to do with my employer, but this is a money system that Congress is part of, and I frankly think, uh, you know, ask yourself uh, if Ron Wyden is stepping up for the internet, if Zoe Lofgren is continuing to fight for the internet as she has for many, many years, if Daryl Issa, who uh, you know is really at the forefront of trying to come up with a sensible alternative, um, think about writing a check to these people because I hate to say it, but that makes a big difference. Uh, you know, and if enough people write hundred dollar checks individually. Together, that's as much money as one industry group writing one big check. Oh. So it's, you know. I'm going to add something that's a little in the middle of these two, which I think is pretty important, right? It, sure, there's the, you know, let's, let's play the game and, and put a, pour a lot of money into campaign coffers. And yeah, that's effective in a, a lot of ways. And then there's, there's sort of this reverse of, oh, let's just be really loud um, and get the public involved. And the simple reality is those are really fraught ends of the spectrum. So let's just talk about people really quick. There's this big push, and, and yes, Tumblr did a phenomenally great job, and, and I really respect those folks, and I know this is on the record, so I'm, I'm going to hesitate for a minute in, in what I'm about to say, but it's, it's the following. Look, when you go to the Hill and you meet with congressional staffers, the best they can ever offer you from that public outcry is, oh, we weighed our mailbags. And yeah, it's a data point, but it's a really small data point, and it's not really that useful. What they need is they need information, because you've got these young staffers on the Hill, some of whom are writing the legislation, others who are trading the, the favors to, to push the votes around, and they just don't really know what they're risking in this particular case, or what they could be helping to do in others. And so I would say in this debate, by far the most effective thing was a bunch of us got on a plane. David was one of them. Two of Albert's partners were involved as well. And we went on the hill. And we, you know, we were, our feet were killing us by the end of two days of doing these meetings. And we sat in staff meeting after staff meeting after staff meeting, talking about the risks and talking about the factors. Now, sure, probably organizations that had donated cash to campaign war chests had helped us get those meetings, but that was because we had never done this before. And once you get to the point where you are known as a community, and that's what obviously what we're trying to do with Engine, so maybe this is in some ways a self-serving statement about Engine, but why I believe in it, we want to be a credible entity that when you're sitting in front of the 24-year-old staffer, they realize you do know what you're talking about because you are an entrepreneur, because you are an investor, and that matters because that is what's driving the economy forward. That is a major constituency because you're voting with building the country. And so 
we're never as a community, as a tech community, we're never, ever, ever going to be able to put together the packs and, and play around with the, the special interest money and run the negative campaign commercials because that's not how we operate. It's just simply not. It would be great if we could do that. We're never going to do it. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, a lot of us are engineers. A lot of us have technical, technical backgrounds. I mean, heck, in our community, a ton of people support Ron Paul. Like, this is not going to happen. We're, it, we're never going to win in that domain if we're going to try to pick the right candidates and get behind them. So let's stop worrying about those, those sides and really do what we do really well and educate and talk about the issues and be credible and be data driven and do really good work. So let's, let's make sure everybody here has a, a, a list maybe of what they can do if they want to get involved and influence this. Now, Maybe that's as simple as write the check. Maybe that's as simple as contact your representative. EFF has a great tool that will let you do that instantly. Um, it's linked on our blog. It's on the EFF page. Um, so is, is, if you're an executive um, or you're part of a tech company, get on the airplane. That's number three on the list. Is there anything else on the list for everybody here if they want to check those boxes and say, is there anything else I can do? The, the easy answer is talk about it. I mean, get informed, get yourself informed, um, understand that. That's why you're here, but you're not the only ones. I mean, you've got peers and colleagues. Get them informed and educate everybody you know. That, that's ultimately our tool, right? Talk to, talk to Duckman, right? Didn't, didn't Facebook <clears throat> just tell us that we're 4.6 degrees of separation from every other person yeah. on the planet? Right? And, and, th and that's our most From powerful tool. Tool. Facebook. <laughs> so, so let's get to the next question. Yeah. Hi, uh, Declan McCullough from CNET in San Francisco. Uh, it's, uh, all, all, everything you said is, is great, but, it's not, um, but I'll take you, um, you seriously when it's not just Tumblr, it's uh, Google puts it on their homepage, Amazon, eBay, Facebook, Twitter, everyone who's uh, collectively expressed concern, uh, concerns and has a direct relationship with American voters, unlike, uh, say, Viacom, puts it on their homepage and generates 100 million calls. That's when the industry is going to get serious. But, um, uh, uh, I, but a, a question for the panel. I mean, you've got seven people, and they're all, you're all really, you're not fans of SOFA, which is kind of a shame. So let me play devil's advocate. I'm, I'm not a fan of the legislation. I've written almost any, more than anyone else, almost anyone else uh, critiquing it. But uh, let, let me ask you this. Fred, Fred you're saying, Let's go after the ad networks. Uh, let's go after uh, the payment providers. We're, um, and instead of doing what SOPA is talking about, which is up there, it's DNS blocking, maybe it's deep packet inspection for URL blocking, it's, uh, it's, it's IP address blocking, certainly. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the widened alternative introduced tomorrow takes uh, something uh, like that in terms of the approach. But if you're trying to, if you're the MPAA and the RAA and content owners, and you're saying, look, you can go to thepiratebay.org and see our stuff, it's supported by ad networks. And the ad network on Pirate Bay is Z5X.net, which is based in Israel. So you can pass your proposal, and it's not going to put Pirate Bay out of business. So what are you going to do that's actually going to help? Well, I don't think any one thing is going to magically solve the whole problem. So I think number, as I said, I think alternatives like Spotify and Netflix are going to do more to put all of these guys out of business than anything Congress is going to do. Number two, I think there is payments, there's ads, there's a number of places you can start. For example, I understand. Oh, sure. Let's imagine there is an ad network based in Israel that is, uh, you know, putting these ads on the PirateBay.org. Um, I am willing. I am willing to bet that there are a lot of brand owners who may or may not be interested in having their ads there. Um, they may have the ability to pull their ad traffic from that ad network. Because, you know, that's certainly a possibility. We have said to advertisers on our own networks, um, if there are uh, sites you don't want your ads to run on, there's exclusion tools that have been available to you since day one. So there are other places we can apply pressure. I'm not think, I don't think we can rely on one enactment from Congress to magically solve the piracy problem. I do think we can make a big dent by following the money, and I think we will not make a big dent by doing site blocking and search removal. So it's a question for me about efficacy. Um, I don't see, you know, we've just heard, it's not hard to understand why site blocking and search removal will not work. What I'm saying is drying up the money will help. Will it solve everything? 
No, but it will help, and site blocking and search removal will not. Fred, is, is visiting the Pirate Bay today a crime? No, absolutely not. But this legislation would prevent me from being able to do that? Well, as we've just heard, it probably wouldn't prevent you oh, well, from being true. able to do that. <laughs> but so it would be preventing me from not committing a thing that's not actually a crime? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, it, it, yes. Okay. That, doesn't that sound bad? <laughs> yes. Okay. I just want to clarify. So, so, some people would say that's unconstitutional. Some people would. Yeah. So, so let's go over here to the next question. Uh, have people been familiar with bit currency and innovation in monetary systems in general over the internet? Because if you dry up the current payment systems, who's to say they're going to come up with a new way to trade and share and for Be Better to innovate. Sure. I, I, I do think that one other thing that this is doing, and Paul told me um, that he had tried this argument in the past on the Hill, and apparently it's a, it's a, um, uh, not a good argument. But there is a lot of similarity to prohibition here, right? As you're trying to suppress something, you're creating lots yes. of vendors for illegal activity. And yes, I do think that the harder you're trying to crack down on this, it, the, the toothpaste is going to come out someplace else. And one of the places it's going to come out is in the creation of systems that are not at all controllable and that provide alternatives and that provide whether, you know, Bitcoin version one is kind of, I think, a bust for various reasons we can talk about some other time, but there will be a Bitcoin version two and at some point it's going to work and then, you know, so I do think that one of the absolutely critical things in all of this is easier legal consumer friendly alternatives is the answer to a lot of things. Let's go back over here. Thank you for this fascinating conversation. I'll add the video, which is live, I guess, um, but will be recorded to World University and Schools uh, beginning law school. Um, World University and Schools like Wikipedia with MIT OpenCourseWare, and we'd like to accredit in 50 to 100 countries. It's a huge vision. Um, my question is to what degree, um, so could we pull an internet here with other countries um, in the distributed manner of um, legal systems um, and uh, draw on other countries' legal precedent or influence SOPA law such that its precedent to other countries is not as negative as it seems? And it, it seems rather delimited, too. Well, I mean, so from the congressional perspective, I mean, I will tell you that one of the arguments that gets the least traction in Congress is, but other countries do it differently. Um, <laughs> it is the case that um, the moral suasion that we have over other countries that want to censor the internet for political reasons, uh, whatever, however strong or weak that suasion is, I think goes out the window with SOPA. Right. So Hillary uh, Clinton, uh, uh, several months ago, in talking about Arab Spring and the, and the role of uh, social networks in, in uprising, uh, says, um, some countries have ele erected electronic barriers that prevent their people from accessing portions of the world's networks. They've expunged words, names, and phrases from search engine results. They've violated the privacy of citizens who engage in nonviolent political speech. With the spread of these restrictive practices, a new information curtain is descending across much of the world. Um, that's a really hard message to send if you've just passed a law in which you expunge words, names, and phrases from search engine results, right? If you block certain people from accessing certain sites. Um, so, you know, if our hope is actually to, uh, uh, to engage the rest of the world with internet freedom and the way the United States has been engaged in internet freedom for the last 20 years, we're moving in the wrong direction. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so suppose this law came into effect and uh, they uh, quickly discover that the uh, DNS workarounds exist and that they're not very effective. Well, I mean, I look at the language here. It says that uh, the site service providers are required to take technically feasible and reasonable measures designed to prevent access. And I would think that the, co the copyright owners would immediately say, oh, drop a level down to the protocol stack and go after the routing tables. And that's going to cause a whole lot more havoc on the internet than, than DNS will. And I'm curious, is, does the law preclude that? Or would that actually be? No, I think that's exactly what it says. 
Well, any reasonable measure. Yes. The, it's, when it says any reasonable measure, you know, my first thought on reading that uh, a year ago was, well, then we're fine because there is no such measure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I realized that that would not be much protection if the thing went through, so, so I got involved. Uh, but when you start talking about what is a reasonable measure, you're not just saying where is it in the protocol stack, it's, um, gee, at that level, do I have the ability to make content decisions at the moment? And, you know, so Comcast was mentioned earlier. Uh, we could conservatively estimate the value of their capital plant for handling IP packets at around a billion U.S. dollars. You know, it could be uh, twice that, could be half that, but that's a rough order of magnitude. Um, that is dramatically less than what it would have to be if they had to go down in the protocol stack in order to enforce this. So they would just say, no, it's not technically reasonable because it's not economically reasonable. But the fact is they can already make that argument about DNS blocking. And so the, when, um, I forget who was talking earlier about this, that uh, we're relying on a lot of prosecutorial Discretion. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Um, we're also relying on uh, the judges to decide what is or is not a reasonable technical measure. I'm not. I've talked to a lot of judges. I have to tell you, I don't want those guys making that decision. Let me also point you uh, to folks who are interested to page 19 of the proposed uh, legislation. We didn't talk about this because it's kind of deep in the weeds, but it's directly to your question. Uh, they already thought of that, right? But rather than going one step deeper in the protocol stack, the Attorney General is empowered on page 19 of the legislation to uh, enforce against, quote, any entity that knowingly and willfully provides or offers to provide a product or service designed or marketed for the circumvention or bypassing of measures to prevent access to websites. So, I mean, I, I personally find this provision to be, uh, uh, you know, it is not terribly well thought through. There's a lot of things just reading it that you're like, well, what does that mean? I'm off, people who offer to provide. I'm like, does that mean Mozilla is suddenly subject to action because Mafia Fire puts an extension in the Mozilla store? I mean, there's a lot of chaos that this provision, I think, doesn't really think through. But it goes to show that when DNS blocking doesn't work on day two, um, people are already thinking in the bill, okay, what else are we going to seize or enforce against or hold liable or force to monitor or et cetera, et cetera. So I think your question is absolutely right. Like, let's think about the next day. Let's get the next and, question. And, uh, yeah. uh, my name is Mark Hall. I'm with Paramount Pictures. Paramount uh, is owned by Viacom. I have a question for David Ulevec. Um David, uh, of the 30 to 40 million subscribers, that you have today, why is it that you haven't chose to implement DNSSEC? Uh, so actually something that we've considered, we've, uh, it's likely to happen at some point. Uh, we think there are more pressing security problems to focus on first. Uh, do you think DNS redirection is, is a viable security uh, tool? Do I feel DNS redirection is a viable security tool? So, I mean, I think the line of questioning you're going down is sort of how can we do DNSSEC with DNS redirection? Is that the? No, I just, I just want it. I want your opinion because I, I, I know that. So there's all kinds of different. So different, you know, go back to things like stateful firewall inspection. Different times in the internet have called for different security measures. Right now, doing things in DNS. Uh, is one way that people accomplish things. They also have firewalls and other things. And things at different scale and at different parts, so we operate the edge of the network. Things like what Sophie's talking about sort of operate more on the, what I would describe as the core of the network. So when I talk about the edge, I talk about people that make decisions on how their individual internet experience is experienced. Things that are operating the core tend to have much wider collateral damage. So different security mechanisms are tend to be better at different levels. But for some people, DNS security redirection is great. Paul's got a, a quick very point. Small, a very yeah. small portion of our customer base takes advantage of that. Let, so let's get Paul's point, and then I want to, to make sure we get to the. Briefly yes. add my own comment to that. Um, blocking uh, DNS redirection or blocking or any kind of DNS firewalling or policy based stuff can be very effective uh, when it is practiced voluntarily. 
So uh, a lot of us sell a lot of technology or give away a lot of technology that makes that possible for people in the enterprise or even universities. It's when it's government mandated that it starts to become ineffective. Well, you publicly stated that some, you're okay with some crime being prevented by DNS filtering, such as child pornography, but you won't go the extra mile for other types. At least you've been quoted publicly. Maybe that, that's an incorrect statement. Uh, that would be a misquotation of or smashing together of several things I've actually said. Um, to the extent that uh, and, and child abuse materials is kind of uh, it's an argument ender, so I don't want to do that. Uh, I think that if government tries to mandate a control that's in that center box on that picture up there, uh, it will not work. It doesn't matter whether it's child abuse materials or anything else. It will not have the desired effect. It will have any number of undesired effects. And, and I have no problem with it, talking about the child abuse. Um, there's another bill introduced that's called uh, Protecting Children from Online Pornographers. Uh, which is a very Orwellian title when you read what's actually in the bill. Uh, the same day that bill was introduced, there was a worldwide arrest of 200 people, and the largest ring of um, child pornographers was arrested globally. So I think what inevitably happens is that certain things are proposed and horrible things are attached to it for motivating it at a time when we clearly have lots of other enforcement mechanisms that are, in fact, working. And I think that's a very... Uh, this goes back to Mark's point uh, earlier. Um, lots of terrible things get thrown in in order to get something through. Um, and I think we need to look at what the alternatives are that we already have available and that are being used actually effectively. So we, we, have, we, have, we have five minutes left, and I just really want to make sure that we get uh, to, to all the rest of the questions. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm Al Perry, also an employee of Paramount Pictures. Uh, I want to thank Anthony for your moderation, uh, Google for hardening comments that you do acknowledge that there is some shared responsibility and that there are some things that can be done. Um, a comment to Mark, uh, you uh, quote uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. She later uh, clarified her comments to say that it is possible both to uh, be sort of supporters of Arab Spring and freedom of expression and uh, recognizing the need for uh, protection of IP because uh, stolen content is not the same thing as freedom of expression. My question really is to the others on the panel um, who say that this isn't your problem. Um, our industry and your industry really are much more aligned than what I'm hearing on this panel. Uh, we are, in a sense, codependent. And I want to challenge you to think about it that way because our content works best when we have your technology and devices because we all have consumers we want to reach. And your devices without our content aren't as uh, enticing. And so it is really not productive to hear uh, that this is not your problem and therefore you're not gonna try to solve it. Because it's all about problems. And that's only just the people in this room and my industry, right? It's also the problem of the United States when as, you know, as productive as your industry is, Ours also is also, we hire people, we put money into the economy. Uh, it is a preeminent, dominant industry in the sense that we send more of our films out than we take back into America. So it, um, it harms the American economy and the American cultural life. I'm not the worst enemies of America, before they do terrible things to us, will watch our movies, and some of them even pay for it. And they do so on your devices. Right, so it, it, given some of the movies I've recently seen, the argument might run the other, right. hostility might run the other direction. But as, as you will, but, but I just want to leave you with that question to really think about whether it really is not your problem. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I think the answer is is a little bit easier though than you would, you might like, which is you talk about this codependence and and the similarities. It depends how you define that, right? Like we don't we don't see it as we're structured in a particular way, and our structure is dependent on on the studio structure, for example, and the distribution structure that exists for content. We're, we're, we're similar, as we talk about the internet as a mechanism of sharing information, right, and provision content. And, um, and frankly, I would argue that, that at least what I'm for personally is democratizing the creation of content, making, it, making tools readily available so that anyone can produce and widely disseminate a, a, a compelling piece of entertainment, right? And 
I'm sorry? You said two different things. You talked about information and then sure. talked about entertainment. So why are those different? Well, because they might not necessarily be the same. Right? Because you know, freedom of expression and freedom to access information, one thing, okay? But certainly Albert has companies that he invests in. You wouldn't want to have their technology licensed on some compulsory basis that you were not able to determine. You would, I'm sure you protect their IP. No, actually uh, we oh, don't. Yeah. Yeah. Actually we don't. You, you, no, we have, this is a very no. fundamental okay, so, difference. <laughs> no protection, so, no trademark protection, come on. Look, so, are you kidding me? So the, the, the vast majority of what is actually what companies are actually succeeding in protecting is creating a large network of people who are interacting with each yes. other. So you could, I could give you the entire source code for Tumblr today. In fact, there's a company that's tried to do exactly this. They've copied Tumblr feature by feature. Yep. And they haven't gone anywhere. So in fact, on the internet, very little is protectable because you can see what every other company is doing. And because even though I'm running my source code on my servers and you can't see it, you can see the effect of what the end user can see. So stuff gets copied feature for feature in our world every day, mm -hmm. every day. So and you're telling me you have not protected your trademark? Why is that relevant? Uh, uh, we're talking about, we're talking about a right. We're talking about an IP right. So I, I'm just asking if you, if you don't. Well, I, I, no, no, I, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a completely fair question. So companies file for trademark protection, absolutely. And um, trademark is a right, that's another intellectual property right, and we can talk about you know how and how that gets enforced and whether we need additional enforcement mechanism for that or not but I haven't heard anybody tonight say that we don't have sufficient mechanism for enforcing trademarks has that been any part of that discussion tonight? so I, I, I want to yeah. yeah thank you I want to make sure we get to the last two questions so we are um, this is a question about intellectual property uh, the major IT companies like uh, Google and Apple and Cisco I understand, take the profits from their, I've been hearing a lot about this, that they take the profits from their intellectual property generation in the United States and move it to Ireland, and then they move it to Cayman Islands, and it goes around a circle. And so uh, a great amount of intellectual property that should have paid taxes in this country doesn't, and they are now themselves lobbying the Congress to get a free day and bring it back with a minimal tax. So I don't know if you can answer that. That's a problem on our side. Well, let me just, I mean, I'm not the tax expert by any stretch, but let me start by pointing out that more than 50% of Google's revenues are generated outside the United States. Uh, so uh, when folks say that uh, there are a lot of Google revenues trapped overseas, that is absolutely right. And it's in large part because the revenues were generated outside the United States. So uh, I, I, you know, when it comes to Google's contribution to the U.S. and the global economy, uh, you know, I, we pay a lot of taxes, we create a lot of jobs, we've created a lot of jobs this year, we created a lot of jobs last year in the United States and in other countries. Um, and I think, frankly, the internet sector has been a bright spot in creating jobs uh, in the United States. Uh, attracting talent to the United States, which comes, they come here, they create startups, which then create more jobs in the United States. So from my perspective, this is an industry far from, you know, we are not, uh, you know, moving all of our jobs and doing all these things to uh, exit the United States. Quite the contrary, this industry is a bright spot in the American economy, and part of it is getting the legal structure right. I mean, the fact that we had the DMCA in 1998 is one of the very big reasons, in my mind, why we have an internet economy that started here. Um, and, you know, this is, these laws potentially upset that. So let's uh, get the last question from Andrew. Sure. I, actually, I'm going to try to cram a couple of things in. Um, first, I'm, I'm, glad we have two representatives. I'm glad we have two representatives from Paramount because there's a detail I'd like to get clarity on. Uh, I've asked this question, I've asked these two sets of questions to two sets of studio representatives so far. The first question is, exactly how many sites are we talking about? We've gotten two answers. From NBC Universal, the answer is tens or maybe hundreds. The answer from Fox, 20th Century Fox, between 50 and 100. So I think we need to understand the scope of the target and compare it to the scope of the legislation. And then the second question, I'd love to know if Paramount has different numbers well, than these. How many? How many? 
This is excellent news, right? The government's already seized over 400. So if, so you only, if we only have 10 or 20 or 50 left, so, so I want, uh, we're and, almost done. And then, and then I am told that the criteria for rogue sites are supposed to be clear. This is the worst of the worst. We're not talking about gray areas. Yes or no are scribbed and rapid share rogue sites within the meaning of this legislation. Whoop. Script. I think that um, I, I'm not the person to opine on the specifics. I won't hold you to it. Okay. No. <laughs> I think that if you have, I think what, I, your concern is legitimate about the definition. I think that is being worked on. We should continue to have to refine them. And, uh, but I don't think it's, it's useful for me to try to find out. Okay. Well, if it's that clear, it seems to me there should be a yes or no on sites that are as prominent as those, as those. And the fact that we can't get a yes or no, I think is an important thing. So I'd like to criticize a little bit, because I think this has been very, very useful, but I don't think we're being hard enough, okay? I, I agree with Mark. This is not a question of refinement. I think this is a question of hell no. And why is it hell no? Because we need some historical perspective, and what I'm not hearing in a lot of places is historical perspective, and sadly, uh, I'm hearing from reporters who have not heard of the Pro-IP Act. I'm hearing from reporters who have not heard of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I'm hearing from people who think that, oh gosh, look, piracy just popped up on our radar as a problem. What are we going to do about it? And the historical perspective needs to be that we have a, a, a regime in which the powerful entertainment interests have been getting, over the last 10 to 15 years, every conceivable advantage. They've gotten the copyright term extended to, to, to life of the author plus 70 years. They've gotten statutory damages without a proof of a penny of damage raised to $150,000 per work infringed, leading to the recording industry in the LimeWire case asking for trillions of dollars in damages, leading the judge to say you're asking for more in damages than the entire profits of the recording industry since Thomas Edison invented the phonograph record. Okay? We have the, the recording industry and plaintiffs in these cases arguing in courts that they don't actually have to prove copyright ownership. They're proving that they don't actually need to prove every infringement for which they're seeking damages. They're proving that they don't actually need to prove transmission in order to prove a distribution case. They're, they're saying that they need not prove harm. Fortunately, the one restraint is the eBay decision in the Supreme Court saying you actually have to show some harm for an injunction. Um, and now in this legislation, you know what they're doing? They're saying they don't need a bond. They don't need to put their money on the line when they work a catastrophic result. They're not going for regular injunctions. They're going for takedowns. And I think that what people need to do is to make clear just how far the pendulum has swung, and I think that there needs to be a counterattack. I think we should bundle a few things in. We say. I could not agree with that more, but I think you're sadly mistaken on the DMCA. There are two parts to the DMCA. The two parts. The anti-circumvention provision means that uh, uh, we have to go through this rulemaking every three years in the Copyright Office to ensure that decent, ordinary, lawful uses can be allowed with, with which are completely lawful under the copyright law, do not violate the section 1201 and 1202 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. 
Exceptions are made only through a rulemaking process in, through the Library of Congress in a way that's ridiculous. The other part of the DMCA is not an enforcement. It's a safe harbor. And that has been brilliant. And it has safeguarded innovation of companies like YouTube and others. And that is being bypassed by this law. This is right, putting that, the notice and take down provision out of it. I've spoken that, enough. No, that's, that's, <laughs> that's great. I, 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 I want of additional debate. <laughs> so what I want to do now is I want to give uh, a big hand to our whole panel for doing such a great job and staying late. <laughs>